Is there a weeknight that works for you? Uh, I'm trying to look at maybe two different possibilities, maybe doing something uh, from Right Now Media where you could get the, uh, the lesson, the, the, the speaker, and see that, view that at home. And then at our designated time, we would uh, pick up some of those questions and look at the scripture and do something. Or I might just do uh, a short Bible a study out of one of the, the scriptures um, kind of looking at uh, either First or Second Timothy at the moment, but um, let let me know either by email or calling the co- the uh, church office and uh, sharing sharing and expressing your your interest. Uh, a couple things coming up. We will have confirmation Sunday on August the twenty third. Uh, we've got five uh, young ladies that were part of confirmation class, and so we're excited to have them become members of the church. Ministry board on August the 31st at 6 p.m. I'm going to take just a moment to say uh, Thursday and Friday via uh, the Internet, I was at the Global Leadership Summit. And counting down, I think this is either my sixth or seventh time to participate in that. 17, uh, excuse me, 15 Uh, faculty presenters talking on leadership. A couple of their slogans are things like this. If you have influence over somebody, you're a leader. But one of the things that really catches me, and I have to be reminded of this all the time, when the leader gets better, everybody wins. So uh, I hope we'll see some changes in me, (laughs) and maybe that will help uh, encourage some, some things with you. A couple of the, the, uh, the words that, that kept coming up over and over again was courage, resilience. Uh, every year when you talk about leaders, you have to be reminded that a good leader uh, is humble. So humility or humble comes up all the time. And I think one that really spoke to me more this year than other times was the word curiosity, the why. Why do we do this? What do we expect to happen? What's going to be the impact of this message? What's going to be the impact of this mission? 
Why do we do what we do? Is this the time to evaluate things and make changes? So anyway, some leadership things. I'm excited about that. Oh, do you have a birthday? Does anybody have a birthday that they want to celebrate and lift up? Anniversaries? Could you repeat that again? Um, all right, on Tuesday. Well, that's interesting. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of how many of your, which speed limit are you talking about? Oh, um, because I, I'm going to use speed limit in the children's time, so that's what triggered my thoughts there. Do you have someone that you would encourage us to be in prayer for? I'm going to mention Jeannie Shear and just ask that you would remember her and your, her family at this time. Is there someone else that you would mention? Well, let's uh, join in singing then, To God Be the Glory, number 98. I'm going to ask you to stand as we sing. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atoned for sin and open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through
Please be seated. Would you join me uh, in our call to worship? Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make his deeds known. Give praise to God's holy name. Let the hearts rejoice of all those seeking the Lord. Pursue the Lord with and his strength. Seek his face always. <clears throat> all his marvelous works. Praise the Lord. Well, um, today, um, I'm going to have the children's time, and uh, Josh and family had something going on today. So today we have uh, Rick and his daughter Harper uh, up in the technology booth. Um, today we're talking about uh, how precepts and principles are important. And so I want to think about what is a precept? Well, um, a precept is like a law or a command. And um, a principle is kind of like an, an ideal or an unwritten rule that uh, applies uh, in a variety of situations, uh, but is always uh, true. So um, I said I was going to mention speed limits. So I got a speed limit sign here, uh, handmade, uh, 35 miles per hour. So is that a principle, or is, is that a precept? So let me think about it. Does that mean that um, it's 35 miles per hour when you want it to be? Uh, does it mean like at 3 a.m. in the morning and there's nobody else on the road, you can go whatever speed you want to? Or does it mean that all the time, always, it's 35 miles an hour until you see a sign indicating a different speed? Okay, so, uh, and then, maybe I should have made it this way, but most street signs go up and down like this, so drive carefully. So is, is that a precept or a principle? That would be more like a principle. They're telling you maybe because of maybe changing conditions, drive carefully, maybe you'll see that sign uh, or it would, maybe would apply when you're going to be entering into a road construction area. You might think of drive carefully when the weather's changing and um, rain might turn to, to sleet, sleet might turn to ice, uh, ice and snow might be part of what you encounter on the road. So drive carefully would be more of a principle. I might... I hope that's kind of clear. A law, a principle, a precept, uh, a spiritual uh, idea that God has placed in our hearts. So use wisdom. All right, well, let's take a moment and pray. And you can pray along if you'd like. Wonderful God, you've given us laws and precepts principles to help guide our lives. Sometimes the, the precepts and the laws um, are, are confusing or hard to understand or inconvenient. But Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom, that you would help us seek you, that you would use these now to turn our hearts and our thoughts to you. We thank you, Jesus. In your precious holy name we pray, amen. Okay. Oh, now we're going to have some special music from, uh, pre-recorded from our praise team.
I appreciate our, our praise team, our praise band. They've come in and taped several times, and uh, we're just fortunate to have them as a part of a ministry in our church. Let's take some time now and be in prayer and bring what's on your heart before the Lord. In a few moments, I would like to lead us in a prayer. Father God, our wonderful God, we praise your holy name. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to you, O Lord. Lord, we want to magnify your holy name. You're the most high God. May we elevate our thoughts to look to you, to seek your face, to acknowledge you as the God is above all things. How wonderful and how amazing you are. The world that you've created. Your presence in this world. The access that we have to our amazing God. Oh Lord, we praise you. Lord, we bend our knees and we come before you for the honor of your name, O oh God. Forgive us for all our sins. We confess that we need you. We need your, your sacrifice, your salvation that you offer to us to rescue you, to rescue us from our sin and our guilt and shame. Precious God, restore us now. Set us free now to follow you, to serve you, and to seek your face. In these unprecedented times, we look to you, the sovereign God, maker of heaven and earth, to be our refuge, that we might find safety in resting in your shadow. Be our fortress where we can regroup and plan strategies for how to cope with this pandemic, yet do the things that you have called us to do. We pray that you'd be our deliverer and keep us from sickness and harm. Be our overcomer that takes away our fears, our anxiety, and help us to engage our faith and hope, to give confidence to others that we're not paralyzed or crippled because of COVID, but we will be smart and creative to help meet, help meet people's needs and to share the gospel. Precious Lord, we pray that you would magnify your presence among us Make us more aware that you show up, that you're at work. And so we pray that you would help us magnify our faith. Magnify our courage. Help us to walk in confidence. Confidence because you're with us all the time. Your very presence gives us a sense of safety, security, reassurance. 
You've placed deep in our hearts a sense of your peace. And you want us to, to find that peace which surpasses understanding. Oh, Lord, be magnified. Be glorified in the things that we do, the things that we try to accomplish in your name. We praise you. A great and amazing, glorious God. Lord, I would pray for Jenny Shear. Be near to her. Give her peace. Awaken a special sense of joy, of your nearness and love that you have for her. And I pray that you'd be with her family, to hold them close in your arms. May they experience your love. May they find each day has new moments of your sacred holiness. May they be refreshed be encouraged by faith and hope. I thank you, Jesus. God of great glory, when you come, may you find your church ready like a bride who is longing for her groom. May we keep before us the preparation to be the spotless bride without stain or blemish that our love for you would be a shining light for the world to see a redeemer and a king. We thank you, Jesus. How wonderful you are. How amazing is our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer. We pray all of this now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would join with me now in that spirit that Jesus gave his disciples, he said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, at this time, we would like to spend some time thinking about our gifts of our tithes and our offerings for our loving God. <laughs> you probably saw the baskets when you entered, and that's... Uh, you can always give your tithe either coming or, or going. We thank all those that are watching for your faithfulness and, and mailing in uh, your tithes and your gifts that our ministry might reach more and more people. Receive now this prayer of dedication. Heavenly Father, we are indeed thankful for the blessings that you have, that you have seen fit to bestow upon us. Grant that these offerings may serve you in the building up of your church and then the life of its members bringing forth your kingdom. We pray this now in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Our scripture today is in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And read verses 1 through 15, and then we'll add verse 17. I'd like to invite you to stand as you're able for the reading and the hearing of God's holy word. Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up the ark of the of God, whose name is called by the name the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. So they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. 
And they brought it out to the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments, of fir wood, on harps, on string instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. And that was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was, when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, that he sacrificed oxen and fattened sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Verse 17, so they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to please be seated. We've had uh, several lessons from uh, the life of David, and uh, we'll share uh, this week, and then we'll conclude next week. Um, I'd like to mention I'm using the life of David from uh, uh, Chuck Swindoll's book uh, from his Great Characters of the Bible series. When I mention the name David, most people might immediately make an association with David and Goliath. Or some people might think of uh, David and that, uh, that extramarital activity, uh, uh, David and Bathsheba. Or others might think of David as the, the shepherd boy who God chose to be king. Or David, the psalm writer, But none of these are the images that God thinks of when he first thinks of David. In Acts chapter 13, verse 22, we have this declaration. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom he had given the testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. There's no mention of a giant slayer, a shepherd boy, a songwriter. No, God likes this image and this idea about David. Here is a man after my own heart. David, someone who would care about the things that God cares about. He's a man whose heart beats in sync with God's. When God looks to the right, David looks to the right. If God looks to the left, David looks to the left. And when God says, this is something I care about, David says, I care about that too. That's being a person after God's own heart. Some of us look upon life as, well, you win some and you lose some. You just put forth your best effort. That's all you can do. 
Nobody is perfect. Others say, if God says it, I want to do it. Now, maybe the, excess, the second expression relates a little bit more to where I'm going today. Are you seeking after the things of God? Are you a person in pursuit of God's heart? In the family of God, it's been suggested that there are two categories of people. In the first group, there's a group of people who spend part of their time with God and part of their time in carnal living. A lot of moaning and complaining, uh, recovering from the path that has taken them away from God's plan. But the second group doesn't spend much time very far away from that straight path. They're always taking account of themselves. Where am I? How close am I to what God has expected for, of me? What God has planned and prepared for me? Am I living for God? Am I living for myself? To those people, excuse me, For the second group, there's nothing in their lives that, about God that is insignificant. Those who live most of their lives in the second category are very rare. There are not a lot of people who have set their mind on seeking God's heart, who obey God's precepts and honor God's principles. But David did. So here we get to our our children's time. When you drive down the road and you see a speed limit sign, say 35 miles an hour, that's a precept. It means 35, whether it's 3 a.m. or 3 p.m., whether it's open road or rush hour traffic, traffic. The limit is clearly marked at 35 miles an hour. That's a precept. There's no give or take. A precept can be a law a command, a statute of God. If there was a sign that said, drive carefully, that would be a principle. It means one speed in heavy traffic or, free, or on the freeway. It means something entirely different on a deserted road in Montana. You drive carefully and you drive slower when a road is under construction. You drive differently when it's icy and snowy. That's a principle and it needs to be applied with wisdom. In our story today, we've jumped in the life of David, um, kind of a huge jump, actually. So let me go back and kind of do a little refresher and suggest, as I did earlier, that when David was about 17 years old, that's his age when he took on Goliath. Then he saw, uh, made him a... a, a brought him into his court, made him a captain of his army, and he served as a captain in Saul's army until about the age of 25. And it was then that he began to be uh, a refugee, fleeing from Saul, hiding out in caves, and, and uh, God sending him the malcontents for him to train and to have some valiant men of, of war. David was 30 years old when Saul was killed on Mount Geboa. So at the age of 30, David became king over Judah and reigned at Hebron for seven years until he became king over all of Israel and moved his capital to Jerusalem. So at the age of 37, David is now in Jerusalem and he's beginning to take survey of a much larger uh, ongoing of people and activities and one of the things that really God puts upon his heart is that worship isn't as effective as it could be. Worship isn't uh, reaching the people in the way that it ignites them and unifies them and draws them closer to the Lord. And as he thought about that, the one thing that seemed to be missing, the very heart of worship, was the fact that during the reign of Saul, the Philistines had captured the Ark of the Covenant, and Saul was never able to regain that. And so David took it upon himself to have this mission. I've got to go and claim the Ark of the Covenant. Now to our, 
our Gentile ears what's so significant about the Ark of the Covenant. In the Old Testament, uh, from the time of the building of the ark with, with Moses through uh, years and years of, of worship, the ark of the covenant always represented this is the presence of God. Now, I don't know uh, for us sitting in the pews how often we think about and acknowledge that where two or three are gathered in his name, the presence of God is among us. But they had an experience of the Ark of the Covenant representing the, the mercy seat and God sitting on that mercy seat in his presence. There would be a special light, a light and a cloud mixed together that hovered over the Ark whenever God was present with them. And that's the Shekinah glory of God. And when they experienced that, it was almost there were times in the tabernacle that you couldn't enter into the tabernacle because the Shekinah glory of God filled the whole space. And they didn't dare enter, but they knew God was in their camp. I don't know about you, but if that would create in you that, that reverence and that wanting to bow down and to worship and to shout for joy, and to experience God is here. That's what David wanted. So 2 Samuel 6 tells us the Ark of the Covenant was on its way back to Jerusalem. Here's David rejoicing and celebrating. He's dancing about. There's delight and there's, there's energy. The Ark of the Covenant was coming to Zion. There's music, and so David's dancing. There was obedience, and there was the obedience beating in his heart because he wants to be in sync with God. Hallelujah. I can imagine David saying, hallelujah. Well, let me give you a little description of the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, basically, it was made of wood, rectangular box, um, but it was gold-plated on the inside and on the outside. It had a decorative border around on the top and it formed kind of a rim. On top of this, uh, was uh, on top of the open chest was uh, a grate. You could see through that covering. You could see and look into the Ark of the Covenant. And on either end of the covenant was a cherubim, which means a small angel or a young angel. And the cherubim had their wings out so that they faced each other and the tip of their wings would touch. And that was where God was supposed to sit on their wings. Now the contents of the covenant were a golden jar containing manna from the wilderness, Aaron's staff, which is significant because that's the staff that he would hand to Moses and Moses would do all kinds of things with it. Like, Well, anyway, you'll have to read in Moses. And then there was the Ten Commandments, the two stone tablets. So I want you to understand that the Ark of the Covenant is absolutely holy, set apart by God, a place where God would actually come and sit upon it. So no human hand, once it was made, was ever supposed to touch the Ark of the Covenant. God was so careful in uh, expressing his instructions on how it was to be built uh, he was detailed in how he described the, the, the pieces of furniture and the design of the tabernacle that said God was paying, wanted us to pay attention to these details. At the, and the Ark of the Covenant was meant to be carried by the Levites, four strong Levites. So you had poles that were gold-plated that would slide through rings. There were four gold-plated rings, one on each corner of the Ark of the Covenant. You slide the poles through so you never actually physically touch the covenant, the, the Ark, and then you place it on your shoulders and you carry it, the, the four, together. So every aspect of the tabernacle, and especially of the ark, was meticulously, 
spelled out by God. David, in this instance, failed to consult the constructions, the, the instructions. You see, David was a man of expedience. He was a pragmatist. David thought the quickest and best way to get the ark to Jerusalem was to put it on a brand new cart. There's a, a sense of reverence there in David's attempt to say, I'm not going to put this on an old, uh, dirty, uh, multi used a hundred times, brand new cart. But he didn't really follow the instructions. So uh, the cart is now placed on, or the Ark of the Covenant is on the cart. I'd like to read verses 6 and 7. When they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Yuza put out his hand to the Ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Yuza, and God struck him there for his heir. And he died there by the Ark of God. See, not knowing the instructions, not knowing the precepts, Yuza thought he was helping. The ark was slipping. It might slide off the, ark, uh, off the cart. It might get bent up or, or damaged. You should prevent that from happening, right? Let me tell you what is right. It would, have been, it would not have been in danger if they'd followed the instructions. If it had been on the shoulders of four Levites, they would have managed very easily. But David didn't do that. He took the convenient route, and he changed the details to fit the expediency of the hour. So I'll get in David's head a little bit. What was David thinking? We need to get the Ark of the Covenant to J Jerusalem now. Who cares how we do it as long as we get it there, right? Wrong. Of course, God cares. And to prove it, the Lord took uses life. So now David's there standing. He's both angry at what happened, and now he's afraid. Now you might say, I thought you said that David was a man after God's own heart. I did say that. I was repeating what Scripture has said in several places. In hearing that, though, you might be thinking, so what does it mean to be after God's own heart. It, having the desire to know God's heart or to please God's heart does not mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean that every day, that every thought and every action that you will do will be the right thing. It means you're sensitive. It means that details are important. Especially it means when you're wrong, you face it, you admit it, and you ask for forgiveness. Verse 9, David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So the problem was that David hadn't done his homework. We often get into trouble when we think we know the direction that the Lord is leading, and then we run ahead of the Lord. We try to do it in our own imagination. We try to do it in our own thoughts or in our own expediency. In the meantime, the Lord might be saying, I've written a lot of things in my book that could speak to that decision that you just made. I hope that you'll take counsel from me. That's why these things are not working out for you. You need to check my word, and you will find either a precept or a principle, and then follow that. There's always the challenge, do we keep our eyes looking up enough or do we keep looking just ahead, just ahead, to look up, to seek God, to get his approval? You might ask, who cares about the little gold rings? God does. Who cares if you put the Ark of the Covenant on the shoulders of four Levites? God does. If he didn't care so much about it, he wouldn't have explained it and been so meticulous in writing it out for us. And because he cares, so should we. 
Of course, you and I are not going to have to move the Ark of the Covenant, but there's still a lesson for us to learn. David was afraid, a reverent and holy fear of the Lord. And so after some time had passed by, and especially after word came to him how the, the home and the family of uh, obed Edom was being blessed, that they were flourishing because the Ark of the Covenant was in his property. So David must have consulted some Levites, some priests, to say, what did I do wrong? Is there something that would help me? Can you find in God's word what I need to know? He moves forward. 2 Samuel chapter 6. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fattened sheep. Catch this. When those burying the ark, the Levites, four Levites with the poles and with them on their shoulders, and David stops after six paces to celebrate, to honor God's glory, to give homage and respect to the Lord Almighty. David was thankful for another chance, and he showed that reverence and respect for God's holiness this time, David did it right. David inquired of the Lord, and he followed his prescribed method. So what's the big deal? The message, what are we supposed to take about poles and rings and carrying the right on the right shoulders? The message is partly about our life. Our life consists with a lot of details poles and rings, etc., that sometimes drive us crazy, especially if we're bent toward a carnal life. We don't want to take the time to go and find the poles, or should I say, to pray, or to read God's scripture. We're inclined to make excuses so that we don't seek a deeper, more intimate relationship with God. But what did David do? took six steps, they stopped, they offered a sacrifice, they danced before the Lord. Why in the world would David and those around him get so excited? Because they are free. When you obey, you're free. That's a spiritual principle. When you disobey, you're in bondage. All around us we see individuals in bondage because they're dabbling in sin. But they talk about being free when they're not actually free. David dancing before the Lord with all his might is the one who is free. God is always leaning near you, inviting you, encouraging you, calling you, draw near to him. Experience life in his plan, in his way, and you will experience abundance the fruitfulness, the joy, a life in peace because you're free. May it be so for you. Amen. I've chosen for our closing hymn, Here I Am, Lord, number 593, but you don't have your hymnals, but it just sticks in my mind. Would you please stand as we sing our closing hymn?
Receive now this benediction. Now may the life of David teach us some lessons, precepts and principles for us to follow that we might draw closer and closer to the mighty God, drawn in by his love, surrounded by his grace. Go now and let the light of Christ in you shine. Let others see that God is living in you. Amen.